for any kind of work, any kind of action because of this faith. A person who does not manifest it with actions, James would say, your faith is dead. Something that's dead doesn't move. Okay? It's inactive. It's not doing anything. It's dead. Faith is to be always active. It's always to be observable. It's always to be seen in our works. If we truly have faith. Now last time that I preached on this, we went into Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of the faith. And here's the statement how it introduces each one of those heroes. By faith, so and so did this. By faith, so and so did that. And you can see that then faith is an action word. It does something. It's not just saying, well, I have faith. Well, if you do, let's see it. <laughs> what are you doing? What's the difference in your life? What's taking place? If it's not there, then James would say, it's a dead faith. Now, something that James does in this James chapter 2 text is he, he gives a scenario, kind of the one that's just like a, unbelievable that anything like this would happen, but he puts it this way in chapter 2, verse 14 through 17, when he says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and is destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, Stay with the screen now. Depart with peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body. What does it profit? Verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, it does not have works, is dead. Now there's two questions that come up in verse 14 that needs to be addressed so we get an understanding here as best we can. The first question was, what does it profit if you have faith and you don't have works? What profit is it? The second question is one that has even been very much debated through Christianity. And that says, question is, can faith save him? That kind of faith? Can that save him? Well, first of all, what does it profit if you have, say you have faith, but yet you don't have works? I think Adrian Rogers did a good job of trying to explain that how that something without the other is unprofitable. He said, it is not what you eat, it is what you digest that makes you strong. It's not what you gain, it's what you save that makes you rich. It's not what you read, but what you remember that makes you a learned man. It's not what you preach, but what you practice that makes you a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Action. Faith, true faith, has action. It's profitable. Now, the second question is found in that same verse, verse 14. It says, can faith save The NSAV puts it, is it that kind of faith? Can it save them? A faith that doesn't have works, that doesn't show it. Now, you couple that verse, and it makes it even a little more difficult, especially for Baptists who know and think and understand that we're saved by grace through faith alone. It, for he says in chapter 2, verse 24, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. First of all, I want you to understand the word justified. Justified means that someone sees you as righteous. All right? They understand that, uh, that you've been declared to be right. And uh, these verses are perhaps the most controversial in, of James's letters. Even the church fathers even debated whether the James should even be in the Bible as part of it just because of these verses. And then, I'm sure glad I got everybody's attention. This is good, okay? Uh, 
Even Martin Luther, the leader of the Reformation, thought he saw an irreconcilable conflict between James' teaching of being justified by works and the Apostle Paul's insistence that salvation is by faith alone through grace. That's how a person is justified, is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these verses are commonly misused to support the heresy that we are saved by faith plus works. There are many religious groups who teach that today. And I can, I can name those denominations to you if you ever want me to, but I won't do it publicly right now, who really say, well, you're saved by faith, but it's also up to you to do what you can do. It's by your works. That's heresy. That's wrong. What they say is, you must trust Jesus as your Savior, but that's not enough. You've got to do something else besides that. There has to be some works on your part if you're going to go to heaven. You need to have some good deeds of charity and devotion. If you have, if you measure up and everything along with your faith, then, then you're accepted to God. You're declared as if you're right with God. That's what they teach. Now, Paul answered that, I believe, in a, in a real good way in Ephesians 2, 8 and through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. Stop there for a moment. Grace means unmerited favor. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. At the root word of grace is the word gift. It's a gift of God. A gift is something opposite of something that you work for and that you earn. Salvation is a gift. It's by grace that we're saved now through faith, and that not of yourselves, in other words, it's not up to you that you add something to his redemptive work, it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now where does works come in? It comes in after you're saved. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Created, what are we? Created in Christ for good works. That's the natural response after you trust Christ as the Savior, you now have Christ living in you and he begins to manifest himself through your life with what? Good works. And he prepared beforehand that that's the way he wanted it to be, okay? Our works, our good works, are an outward expression of something that already took place on the inside. That's why we come to the baptistry waters. It's a result of an answer of good conscience towards God. That's what the Bible says. And therefore, you want to do what God wants you to do. So you're going to do that, and you're going to publicly profess your faith. And I'm going to tell you something. When somebody publicly professes his faith, that's kind of hard for some because they don't like to get up in front of people. Matter of fact, when you see a grown man like we have seen here lately, men in their 80s, that we baptize and dunk them under water in front of everybody, something had to happen on the inside. Amen. Okay? That's the results. It's an answer of good conscience towards God. That's right. That then what happens? You see that good work come out in your life. You're never being obedient to God. Faith is obedience. Now, I hope y'all realize that, don't you? God says to do things. He told us to be baptized. When you do it, that there you are, doing a good work. You're doing what God told you to do, and that is to publicly profess Him as your Savior before others. Now, a person who does not want to be baptized, I can wonder, did they ever get really saved? Did they? I mean, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't care about well, there's something wrong with an answer of good conscience towards God. Because when you realize what Jesus Christ did for you, it's kind of like, Lord, what can I do for you? What do you want me to do? I'll do it. I'm ready. 
there's that desire in your heart to do good, to do what is right. Now, I look at this and, and I see that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And I'm going to tell you something that really brings back memories to me because this is a verse that I learned when I was in high school in Houston, Texas. I just started going to this one church, West End Baptist Church on Shepherd Drive in Washington Avenue. And uh, while I was at, at that church, I was getting to meet some of the teenagers there. And one day, we were on the lawn of the church, and there was a heated discussion. And there was one fellow by the name of Clarence Speck. And he was arguing that, hey, you've got to be good. You put your faith in Jesus, but you've got to be good. I mean, really good if you're going to go to heaven. And there was kind of a little heated debate, and I got into that debate. And he was emphasizing what I said so many things as faith plus works. In other words, just putting your faith in Christ is not enough. You've got to add to his redemptive work somehow. And so, of course, I was on the side of the debate that said, no, we're saved by grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's not coming to us. It's by faith alone in Christ that he saves us. Well, being new in the church, I began to wonder. I said, I wonder if this church believes like Clarence Peck does. <laughs> Maybe I got the wrong church. I'm not sure. You know what God did for me? It was a blessing. I've never had really heard about Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Never before. Not really. It didn't ever register with me anywhere. And that Sunday morning, following that debate we had, Ted Gaze, my pastor, got us to preach Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. And I said, yes. <laughs> there it is. It's all in the scriptures. Yes, it is. It's there. And uh, I was so excited about those verses of scripture. My friend Nick Nicholson was going up to Durango, Arkansas on a trip. He asked me to go along with him. And I got in the car and all the way up there, I memorized those verses of scripture. And they've been in my heart ever since that day. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith alone. Where there's no boasting, there's no place for boasting. I'd like for us to look at this Romans 11, 6, if we could. And if by grace, then it's no more longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's not of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Does that sound like a riddle to you? It's a simple riddle. It really is. It's kind of like trying to mix water with oil. Does water and oil mix? Nope. No, it separates. And this is what it's saying about here. Grace means you don't earn it, you don't work for it. Work says you work for salvation. Okay? Now hear me out. What he's saying here, it can't be both. It's one or the other. Either you're saved by grace, it's a gift of God, or you've got to work like a devil to get it. Okay? You know, it's going to be one or the other. Because if it's a works, then it's no more longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Do you get it? Yep. If y'all say got it, we'll go on. Got it. Do you get it? Got, got it. Y'all hope we go on. I know. Okay. But you can't put the two together. Look at Romans 3.27 now. Romans 3.27. Romans 3.27. It says... Where is boasting then? Is it's excluded? By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Now verse 28 as well. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. In other words, there's no list of things that says this you have to do, you have to do that, you have to think you need to No. It's purely of grace by faith. And then therefore, what's it say? Where is the boasting then? Isn't that what Ephesians 2.10 teaches us? It tells us 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of work, work lest any man should boast. You know, if you ask an average person on the street, well, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And they say, yeah, I think I will. And I, then I like to ask the question, well, why do you think you will? Well, I'm, I'm a pretty, pretty good person. I haven't really done anything bad, you know. And uh, I think I'll be fine. I'll be good. Now let me tell you something. That's their judgment of themselves. That's right. God is the one who declares who's righteous or not. He's the judge. And the only way that you're ever going to be declared to be right before him, righteous before him, is if he, by grace, through your faith, gave it to you. And he justifies you. He declares you righteous as if you've never done anything wrong. God is the judge, not ourselves. It's God alone. Matter of fact, if we want to really get a good handle on this, it's, it would do us well just to go through the verses that have to do with the matter of being justified. There's six aspects of justification throughout the scriptures. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you the references. I'm not going to read the verses for the sake of time. But we're going to put on the screen right now, if at all possible, those list of verses. So if you want to jot them down. Every one of them are from Romans until we come to the last one that we've been reading from James, okay? So here we go. According to Romans 3.24, we are justified by grace. This simply means we don't deserve to be justified. In fact, we deserve the very opposite. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we're justified by faith. Faith is the human response to God's grace. By faith, we accept the free gift of salvation. By faith, we appropriate what God has already done for us. Romans chapter 5, 9 tells us that we're justified by the blood. Christ paid with his blood for Christ to procure our justification. The debt of sin was met by his precious blood of Christ. And he, now God can justify the ungodly sinner by his blood. Because of right, his righteousness, there's a satisfaction has been made before God who makes the judgment call. Romans 8.23 tells us that we're justified by God, by God alone. The truth here is that God is the person who justifies, not we ourselves. God, again, is the judge, not we ourselves. Romans 4.25 tells us that we are justified by power. Justification is linked to the power of the raised Christ from the dead. Why is that? Because the resurrection proves that God is satisfied with Christ's redemptive work, that he might justify us. And now we come to number six, aspect of justification. James 2, 24, where he says we are justified by works. I'm going through this because if our theme for the year is going to be show me your faith by your works, I want to make real sure and clear that there wasn't any misconception or misunderstanding about that faith plus works gets you to heaven and saves you. And I know this passage of scripture we're taking this same verse from. I want to give you clarity and understanding. And you know, here's the wonderful thing about God's word. It never contradicts itself. In other words, God doesn't speak out of both mouths. In other words, through James, he tells everybody, oh, you're justified by works to get into heaven. Well, that's not really what James is teaching here at all. And I hope and pray that I can explain and give some help along that way. Yes, we look at this passage of Scripture, and we say in this case, Works is an outward proof of the reality of your faith. That's what James is, is making this point about. Faith is an outward, I mean, there's an outward proof of the reality of your faith. By what? Your works, what you do. I want to say this at the outset of it, too, because to me it clears it real easy. 
James is saying here, show me your faith. He didn't say, show God your faith. Now, the thing about God, he can see faith. He knows who has faith and who doesn't have faith. Even Jesus made that assessment as the Son of God many times over. He said, oh, you have little faith. Oh, you have great faith. Oh, you have no faith. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God knows whether you already have faith or not. But you and me, we can't tell if we have real faith or not. It has to be an outward expression. That's what James is saying. Show me. He didn't say, show God. God already knows whether you have faith or not. But he's saying, prove it to me. What's the evidence that you really have a genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? It's going to be shown up, and he could have chimed in with Paul and said, you know what you know you were created under good works? Well, okay, let's see it. Where's the evidence of it? It's like that verse we quote many times. By their fruits you shall know them. By their works, by what they do, what they don't do, what the changed life that they have. And all of a sudden then you can start seeing that, hey, something must have really happened to that person because I see the change. You know what tickles me? I've had parents who have told me about their little child that got saved in vacation Bible school says, when they got home this next week, we can just tell there's a change in him or her. Wow, and just a little kid already. In other words, something took place in that kid's heart. And now, since he's given his heart by faith to Christ, yes, show me your faith by your words. Show me your faith by your words. There ought to be something evident there in every one of the lives that we're really saved. Now, we'll tell you this, too, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Give some thought to it. It's saying faith without works is unprofitable. Well, works without faith is unprofitable, too. A person can have good works, but they don't have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess you'd say if anybody was religious and kept the letter of the law of the Pharisees, but were they saved? Far from it. No. You know, you may deceive me and say, well, look at that person. I'll tell you what, I've been really kind of jogged here lately because we've had men in their 80s get saved. And I thought, well, I've known you from the very beginning. I just cannot believe that you weren't saved. So you can have all the outward spirits but never had the heart transformation where you by faith put your trust in Christ to be your Savior and in Him alone. Matter of fact, I warn you of this, that if you haven't ever trusted Christ as your Savior, you're better because it's not going to be profitable to you. That's right. You know, for those of you out here that believe that, well, it's, I'm justified by faith and works and putting it together, let me say this to you. You need to come and trust Jesus alone as your personal Savior. Do not trust in yourself. We'll never measure up. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Only God is perfect. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we try to say what well, is our works and what we do is we bring Christ down to our level. There's a verse that deals with that. You can't do that. We need to meet His level of righteousness, which is perfect. And we don't. Your only hope of salvation is trust in Christ alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should brag about it. There's no bragging rights when you get to heaven. We'll only be bragging on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. If it wasn't for you, God, I wouldn't be here. You're my Savior. It's not, let's use my name, it's not Jesus and David's the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Amen. I can use your name. Jeff is not Jeff and 
Jesus as a Savior. No, it's Jesus alone as a Savior. That's right. That's where we put our faith and hope and trust in, is in Christ Jesus alone. Then we are justified before Him. Yes. He did not say, show God your faith. God already knew. He was saying, show me your faith. And so our challenge and our theme this year, and I'm just saying, show me or show one another in this audience. Your faith by your works and what you do. Hey, we gave some things. There's so many ways in which you can show your faith. So many ways. Faith is being obedient to God. And one of the ways, let's give you some examples. One thing God tells us to do is to forgive one another. You say, well, I'm never going to forgive again. Well, something's wrong. If Christ forgave you all your sins, and you're not willing to forgive others, neither will my Father in heaven forgive you your sins, Jesus said. So by faith, you say, okay, God, yes, I'll forgive him. I'll forgive him. That's a real faith with God because you're obeying God and you're doing what he told you to do. That's a good work. Forgiving others is a good work. It's manifested. And you can use lots of scriptures along that line like that. And I think, too, that you can show your faith by, well, here's a, stop worrying. <laughs> worrying is not evidence of faith, it's a lack of faith. It's a dependence upon yourself, having the object of use of, oh, I can't handle this, I can't. You're not giving it to God by faith. The Lord, you said, cast all my cares upon you, that you care for me. Well, here it is, Lord, and it's your work <coughs> now. It's your care now. It's not mine. I gave it to you. I don't have to work. Matter of fact, Jesus said three times in one bed, do not worry. Do not worry. And that's even disobedience if you are worried. But if you have faith, what it does is it cancels out worry, it cancels out fear, it cancels out fretting, and it certainly negates doubt. And those are the four things that Jesus said, oh, you have little faith to. Why are you fretting? Why are you worried? Why are you afraid? Why did you doubt? You see, the evidence of faith is in your attitude, your actions, and what you do. Faith is seen in so many ways. So I'm saying, show me your faith. I want to see those works. A God created you in a new person with under good works. I want to see those. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're thinking about. And I think, too, that sometimes your actions can show it. In other words, you understand the word of God is a love letter. That's a good thing to think about during February, the Valentine's Day coming. This Bible here is God's love letter to you. That's right. Now, if you say, oh, I believe that. I believe it is God's word, and it is a message for me today. But then you don't pick it up and read it? Where's the words? Show it to me. If you really think that's God's word, and it's a message to you that he wants to say to you personally, then you'd be picking it up and using it. Show me your faith. Show me your that could go for like going to Sunday school, you know, a church and morning and evening service. It could be participating in intercessory prayer. Don't you know the Bible teaches about intercessory prayer with the brethren? But yet we won't assemble to prayer meeting? Show me your faith by your works. Do you really believe in intercessory prayer? Abandon together with other believers? And giving it all to God? Show me your works. Am I meddling here? Am I getting, are you beginning to understand that if the faith is there in the word of God, what it says and how it should be in your life, it's going to be manifested in your actions. Amen. It will be there. It will come. Sharing your faith with others who are lost is a word that shows that you do have faith in Christ, else why would you share it with anyone else? I could go on and on. Like I said, it could go in so many different ways. 
they really mean that? Are we really showing forth our faith by our works? Now, God knows your heart already. You can tell him that. You know how my, when my heart, Lord. You know what's scary about that? He does. <laughs> he really does. He knows exactly where you are. You can tell anybody anything you want to tell them. You know, you can justify your ways. But I'm going to tell you what God really knows. But then again, you can say, God knows my heart. And he does. And he does. So it ain't really isn't too much about you showing me your faith. What really matters is you showing your faith to God. But the challenge is still what James gave. I'll show you my faith by my works. You show me your faith without works. Guess what? That can happen. <laughs> that's not going to happen. There's no way that you can show your faith without works. Because faith is not just the saying I have faith. It's living that faith. It's exercising that faith. It's something that can be observed by others. Yes, God is in the business of wanting us to come to Him and have faith in Him, trust Him, and then live it out in our lives. There are two keys which I think greatly help us to understand what James is saying. First of all, James does not say, what does it profit though a man has faith? What does it say? Rather, it says, what does it profit if a man says he has faith? Talk is cheap. Words are shallow if it's not backed up by action. James has described a man who has nothing but profession of faith. He says he has faith, but there's nothing about his life that indicates it. Nothing. No transformation. No change. A second key, helpful key to understand what James is saying here is that the fact that he's not saying doing these works is going to save you. It's that, that kind of faith that's just all lip service and talk and not real. That kind of faith. Can that kind of faith save someone? No. A real genuine faith is what saves a person. And that alone. What God is looking for is an authentic faith. A genuine faith. That's real. That's visible. That by the fruits, they can know you've been with Jesus. There's something distinctively different about you. You're always about the business of the Lord's work. You're serving Him. You're living for Him. Why? Because you have received by grace through faith His wonderful salvation. And if He could die for us, the least we can do is live for Him. And it's shown forth in our good works. Such faith is worthless. It's just all... I say I have faith. What good is that? It's all talk and nothing else. You know, I think James could have wrote the little chorus. If you say, then you know it, then you like to serve it. Did I sing that right? I did it. I left something out. <laughs> if you say, then you know it. Clap your hands. Huh? Clap your hands. Clap your hands. That's what I said. Okay. Will surely show it. And that's what James is preaching here. That's what he's saying to us. Don't be phony. Don't be hypocritical. Be real. Show it. What are you going to do this year in 2023 for the Lord that's going to challenge your faith to do something you hadn't done before? We've already had two people in our church that have already taken that challenge. One is which is Carolyn Bentley. She's taking our, our handbells that were given to us. Did you know we have a set? I hate to say this because there might be a thief in the room. We've got a handbell set that's worth $25,000 that was given by the church. And Carolyn, who's never led a handbell choir before, she's going to tackle it. 
and she's going to be looking for your support, your help, and be a participant for that hand bow and add something to the, the ministry and the worship service at Maple Crest Baptist Church. I got tickled at Mark. He had a vision. He said this is going to be his, his, his showing his faith is doing this family conference that's taking place. And, and I said, I let him know that, you know, it's not budgeted to do that, but we do our mission box here, but he has a different plan that he's going to work and do, but there is money there if he needs it to be used for that. Uh, you know, by faith, it's amazing what God has been doing. But anyway, he said, I told him that, that, that those funds would have to be raised because that's how they prepared to do the budget. He said, well, I guess I'll be mowing lawns then. Yeah. <laughs> I told I offered Cliff to help. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he has experience doing that. But see, he's he's tackling something bigger than him. You know, here's the principle. I hope we learn about this thing of faith. If it's not God size, it's not of God. It's something you can do. Then you don't need God. Everything we ought to do ought to be taking us to the edge. It ought to be challenging our faith to do more and better and not just status quo. And not just, well, we're going to stay where we are. Oh, no. The wonderful thing is, as we exercise our faith, then we get to see what God can do. And there's, with God, all things are possible. There's nothing too hard for Him. I don't think you'll have to mow the lawns. Okay, I really don't. Lord, I'm not being disappointed. <laughs> but anyway, God's going to provide. If it's a good work, i got to give you this, and I'm going to quote. Okay, I promise. Second Chron Chronicles, I didn't give it to you, but can you guys look it up? Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. I love this verse of Scripture because it's one of the most challenging verses of Scripture, and it's the most open ended is for whatever good work might be that we want to do. Okay. No, that's not it. Did I say, what did you put up, sir? So, oh, man. First, second Corinthians 9, 8. Was that it? You said Chronicles. Oh, no wonder. I knew that. Okay. <laughs> He's our supply. He's our strength. He's our security. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always have it. all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for what? Every good work. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to do a good work for God. He's your source. He's your supply. He's already said it's open-ended. God's the one who gets it. That's where our faith should be. Our faith should be in God. Not we ourselves in the church. Not according to how much comes in the offering plate. We ought to be looking to God all the time. Say, Lord, we've got a good work we're trying to do here. We're going to do a family conference here, Lord. We're going to do handbills here, Lord. God, would you make all grace abound towards us that we, as we do this, that we'll have all sufficiency for everything that we're trying to put together here and have an abundance for that good work? Lord, would you do that for us? You see, we need to understand faith always has an object on which it relies on. Either God's going to be the object of your faith or your bank account or your abilities or what you have, your friends. You're either going to trust one or the other. You're either going to trust God completely or you're going to trust everybody else, anything else. That's where our focus needs to be. God counts on God. If God wants to really do something great and mighty with make a press baptist church, we got to start thinking God and what God can do. Amen. Uh, Let's stand.